All right, guys, so it seems like these are becoming a pretty regular staple on my channel, but it's only because they keep getting more and more insufferable and disgusting as time goes on. But here we have a couple of new clips that have come out from some of these press briefings with Biden State Department or national security spokespeople. In this case, we got John Kirby, who are constantly just spinning themselves in circles, tying themselves up into pretzel knots to try to justify the unjustifiable in regards to Biden's endless, no strings attached support for all of the brazen crimes that Israel has been committing inside of Gaza for now six months straight. And so here we're going to start off with John Kirby, who is getting into a back and forth with a reporter who's pressing him on the strike that we talked about yesterday on World Central Kitchen uh, aid workers who were struck three separate times in three separate vehicles, clearly marked, coordinating with the IDF, all of that stuff. And, and somehow he is going to claim not only that this was not a violation of international law, but that the U.S. has not seen a single instance of a violation of international law since October 7th. So let's go ahead and watch this clip. Right. Well, the point of condition is the president on February 8th issued a memo and it said, uh, and you already know this, but just for context, it said that it was the policy of this administration to prevent arms transfers that risk facilitating or otherwise contributing to violations of human rights or international humanitarian law. Is firing a missile at people delivering food and killing them not a violation of international humanitarian law? Well, the Israelis have already admitted that the, this was a mistake that they made. They're doing an investigation. They'll get to the bottom of this. Let's not get ahead of that. Um, your, your question presumes, at this very early hour, that it was a deliberate strike, that they knew exactly what they were hitting, that they were hitting aid workers and did it on purpose, and there's no evidence of that. I would also remind you, sir, that we continue to look at incidents as they occur. The State Department has a process in place, and to date, as you and I are speaking, they have not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international humanitarian law. And lest you think we don't take it seriously, I can assure you that we do. We look at this in real time. They have never violated international humanitarian law ever in the past five to six months. I'm telling you, the State Department has looked at incidents in the past and has yet to determine that any of those incidents violate international humanitarian law. So there you go, guys. Um, so much to say about that, right? I'm going to try to condense myself here because it's, it's genuinely enraging to see this level of gaslighting from the Biden administration. But let's just unpack a few things that he was talking about there. First off, no, I don't think that you guys are taking this seriously at the State Department. Or maybe you are taking it seriously and you're just straight up lying to the American people. The U.S. State Department has more resources than any State Department on the face of the planet. And you are telling me that me sitting here in front of a, a webcam talking to maybe a few thousand people on YouTube that I can somehow find direct verifiable evidence of Israeli war crimes in Gaza, but the U.S. State Department cannot. I mean, the, the way that they talk about this shit is as if they think that we're still in like the the information ecosystem of like the 1950s where the only sources of information are either the US government directly or it's mainstream media sort of like mouthpieces for the US government. Do they not understand that we can see direct evidence from people who are on the ground, Palestinians who are going through this directly or journalists who are inside of Gaza, right? Primarily Palestinian journalists who are experiencing this, documenting this in real time or even in some cases the social media posts of IDF soldiers themselves willingly documenting their own uh, uh, war crimes or human rights abuses. D it's like they, they don't even think that that exists, right? To have the audacity at this point with the endless destruction, I mean, Gaza has been turned into a parking lot, okay? We've seen tens of thousands of civilians who have been killed. We have children who are starving to death at this point because Israel is blocking the aid from getting into Gaza. To say that there hasn't been a single, not one, violation of international law is, I mean, it's like, it's almost more glaring than the lies leading up to the, the, the you know, invasion of Iraq. It's almost worse than like the WMD lies, because these are lies that are so much more easily disprovable in real time. But they insist with going with this line of logic. Why do they do this? Okay, why are they lying about this? Number one, obviously, because they're complicit in it. But number two is that... John Kirby knows, the State Department knows, the Biden administration knows that it is totally illegal under U.S. domestic law, under the Leahy Act and under the Foreign Assistance Act to, number one, give weapons, as we have been doing to the tune of billions of dollars, uh, to a country that is using those weapons for war crimes or human rights abuses. And it's also illegal for us to give weapons or, or support to a country that is blocking 
humanitarian aid from the U.S. from getting into any given location. Israel is violating both of those, obviously. That, that's really not even a question at this point. It's not even remotely a question. But they can't admit that because if they admit that Israel's violating international law, then they also have to acknowledge that then the weapons that they're giving them, billions of dollars worth, are illegal, totally illegal, right? And so you just get this bizarre situation where, I mean, he's even like angry in this clip. He's getting frustrated with the reporter who, who's obviously frustrated in turn because of how absurd his statement is here at face value. And I mean, even just on this specific strike against the World Central Kitchen workers, to say that there's no evidence that that was deliberate, no evidence that it was deliberate, even though they were communicating with the IDF, not only beforehand and had been doing so for a while, right? Because the, the World Central Kitchen is even an aid organization that the government of Israel acknowledges, right? They, they don't even try to do the whole, oh, well, they're in cahoots with Hamas, right? So they had been coordinating on their movements with the IDF beforehand and even after, apparently, the first strike happened. They tried to get in contact with the IDF to say, you're bombing us right now. Stop. So they were in contact with the IDF, okay? The IDF was allowing them to go through a deconfliction zone, so it was already supposed to be a relatively safe zone, and then they struck them three separate times. You had the first car was struck, and then some of the survivors of that initial strike got into a second car, that car was struck, some of the survivors tried to move to the third car, that car was struck. They have the logos of the WCK plastered all around the car, easily visible. You can look at the aftermath of one of the strikes in the roof of the car that was struck, you have the logo for the World Central Kitchen right here, and then right next to it, almost directly through it, is the missile that was sent down by, by one of these drone strikes. The idea that there's no evidence that it was deliberate, how, what else would it be other than deliberate? How do you oops-a-daisy three separate strikes targeting aid workers that you're in coordination with, that you knew were there? And, and it's also in contradiction with some of the stuff that even, you know, Israeli officials have admitted to, which is... I've seen some justifications from them that, no, it wasn't necessarily like an accidental strike, but we actually thought that maybe there was a Hamas militant who was either at the warehouse that they were dropping off or picking up food from, or he may have been in the convoy. So they're actually trying to justify it by saying maybe there was a militant amongst these people. But even if you accepted that, think about the implications of that, guys, that Israel suspects there may or may not be a Hamas militant as a part of this aid convoy. And so what? you do three separate targeted strikes and just wipe everybody out? This is the kind of logic that they have to spin themselves into to try to justify this shit. I mean, we have a second clip here, and I'm not going to play all of these because it's kind of regurgitating the same bullshit over and over again, but this reporter asked, it wasn't one strike, but three workers moved the wounded to a second vehicle which was struck, then a third which was struck. How would second and third strikes on marked vehicles be a mistake? And he, of course, just pitches to, like, well, Israel's going to investigate this. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that Israel, the IDF, can be trusted to investigate themselves in a fair and an impartial way, right? And to hold their own accountable. I mean, just to, to follow up on a story that I covered weeks and weeks ago at this point. So Prem Thacker, shout out to him, you know, works for The Intercept right now. And it's been 64 days since that story, if you guys remember, of that horrific phone call of Hind Rajab who was a six-year-old girl who was trapped in a car. We didn't know how long she was trapped in the car for after her entire family that was with her in the car was killed by the IDF. And then they also, you know, followed up and killed the medics who went to go and try and save her. And, oh, you know, the response from the State Department, oh, we're going to wait for an investigation, right? Oh, it looks bad, but, like, let's see what the IDF says. 64 days later, there's no follow-up. There is never any follow-up to any of these situations. None whatsoever. And if there is a follow-up, it's just going to be the IDF lying about it or spinning it in a way that tries to give them plausible deniability and the U.S. State Department will accept it at face value so that they can continue to send them the weapons that they are using on these innocent Palestinians in Gaza. I mean, 64 days later, no update, right? No update on that story. And so the third clip here from Ken Klippenstein, he points out, the question is, how can the U.S. continue to send military aid to Israel without any conditions? Is there no red line? The White House says... We're still going to make sure that they can defend themselves and that the 7th of October doesn't happen again. Is this self-defense, guys? Is this self-defense? A majority of the, the standing structures in Gaza have been leveled to the ground, okay? Tens of thousands of civilians killed, mosques, churches, schools, UN shelters, refugee camps, hospitals, completely obliterated. The, the deadliest 
war for aid workers, by the way, in modern history. And and what are we supposed to take away from this? Oh, this is just self-defense? This is self-defense. I mean, this, this ties into, you know, the other clip that I was going to show you guys here before we get to this uh, Gideon Levy clip. But I mean, again, Prem Thacker was asking about Al-Shifa Hospital. If a targeted operation looks like this, what would one on Rafah, which Israel is planning to do, where over a million Palestinian refugees are, what would that look like? And Matthew Miller's response here is to say, we do not believe that this attack was on a hospital. It was on the Hamas fighters inside the hospital. I mean, think about that, guys. You have, you have John Kirby saying, we're going to make sure they're going to be able to defend themselves. You have Matthew Miller saying that the attack on Al-Shifa Hospital, we looked at the pictures, guys. The entire complex, not just the, the complex of, the complex of Al-Shifa, but the surrounding blocks from this hospital complex, the roads themselves had been dug up by bulldo bulldozers. It's just dirt there now. The entire complex destroyed, and many of the buildings torched, okay? You can see the flame marks, the walls that are blown out in every single part of that hospital. And he's going to claim that the attack wasn't on the hospital. What are we doing? What what world are we living in? The attack wasn't on the hospital. They just, oops, accidentally destroyed the entire hospital and the surrounding blocks around it. This is what they think a targeted operation is, which again leads into the incredibly important question there from Prem Thacker. If this is justifiable, if what they did to Al-Shifa was justifiable because they were in a fight with some Hamas militants, then what the fuck is an invasion of Rafah going to look like? I mean, we've seen the Biden administration over and over again say, well, we believe that Israel needs to have a plan in place for the civilians in Rafah so that they're not put in harm's way. Well, if this is what you think is an example of that, then they're going to go into Rafah and completely level it to the ground with no regard for civilian life whatsoever. I mean, this is like, this is one of the most unbelievable statements that I've ever heard from a U.S. politician given the context of what we're talking about, given the images of what Al-Shifa looked like before and after this two-week raid from Israel. The attack wasn't on the hospital. <laughs> I mean, wh what do you say at this point? Seriously, what do you say? And, you know, on the on the World Central Kitchen strike, Gideon Levy, I think, puts it the best here. Let's go ahead and listen to, to his little clip here on BBC. I'm not sure investigation is so needed. Well, what do you think you will find out? The only question is who gave the order. It's very clear that those people were killed when their cars were spined very clearly, when their traffic was coordinated with the army before. I mean, what will the investigation bring us? The name of the commander who gave the order? Who cares? It's a policy. We have to understand that. I suppose the, the investigation would establish one way or another whether it was indeed a mistake or something more sinister. How can it be a mistake when the cars are so signed? You saw the photos of the car from the roof. There's a huge sign of the organization. I mean, yeah, he's 100% correct. What does it even mean to have an investigation into this? Like, like he pointed out there, what, you're going to get the name of the drone operator or something? You're going to get the name of the commander who approved of the strike? It, this is a systemic problem. They act as if like, I mean, these, these journalists and many politicians and Biden, they act as if this was like a one-off event. The only reason that this strike got more coverage than the ones that have been happening on a very regular basis over the last six months is because it was the World Central Kitchen that has a connection to this famous celebrity chef who does this kind of humanitarian work all over the world. It was because it was Jose Andres connected workers. It was because it was, you know, an American Canadian and some British people and, uh, you know, an Australian and a Polish person. That's the only reason it got more coverage because this has been happening to Palestinian aid workers for this entire conflict. Again, this is the deadliest conflict ever for UN aid workers. I mean, Israel is openly boasting about how the UN and UNRWA, they're just Hamas. So we have a valid justification to go and target them. The deadliest ever for UN aid workers. And they're, you know, the media and, and politicians are talking about this as if like, oh, well, this was just a one-off instance. And so we need an investigation to determine whether or not this was a horrible mistake or whether or not it was something sinister, right? That reporter says, oh, well, what if it was something sinister? Of course it was. What other conclusion from the evidence of, of repeated targeting of aid workers, what other conclusion could you possibly, possibly come away with? Either they are doing it on purpose or they are the single most incompetent military in the history of the world. And it may be some combination of both, honestly. But, but to, to just rule out that it was, as, as Kirby was saying in the first clip, oh, there's no evidence that it was intentional, is absurd, totally absurd. 
And of course, you know, because we just played that clip here on the BBC, I had to show you guys their headline. Not surprising. <laughs> but I mean, deadly airstrike shows system to protect workers, aid workers in crisis, agencies say. Is that what the agencies are saying? Deadly airstrike shows system to protect aid workers in crisis. Somebody else made this point on Twitter when they were quote tweeting this. But they said, like, I've never seen a better example of an outlet totally avoiding what would be like the standard practice of like, you're supposed to explain who, what, when, where, why, or how, right? In these kinds of breaking news events. There's no who, there's no Israel mentioned here. There's really no even where, right? They don't mention Gaza. Why? They don't, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no explanation here. Deadly airstrike, who did the airstrike? Shows system to protect aid workers in crisis. What is the system to protect aid workers? I mean, this ties in perfectly to Joe Biden's statement on all of this, which was infuriating to me. I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but you guys let me know. I mean, I'll skip down here, right? I'm outraged, I'm heartbroken at the deaths of seven humanitarian aid workers, blah, 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 blah. But he says, even more tragically, this is not a standalone incident. Okay, that's true. This conflict has been one of the worst in recent memory in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. That's also true. This is a major reason why distributing humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult. True. Because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver to desperately, you know, in need civilians. So here's my issue with this. Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers. This is the same rhetoric they use when they're talking about strikes that blow up an entire civilian family, right? We believe that Israel needs to be doing more to protect civilians or to protect aid workers. It's a complete inversion of the power dynamic of what's actually going on here. The issue here is not Israel isn't protecting aid workers, it's that they're killing them. It's that they're seeking them out, targeting them, and assassinating them. That's the issue here. They talk, when you use the word like, Israel needs to do more to protect aid workers, it makes it seem as though some other unknown third-party actor is killing the aid workers and Israel needs to be defending them better. That's not the issue. The issue is Israel, the IDF, killing them over and over and over again at a historically unprecedented scale and pace. That's the issue here. And so, I mean, obviously it's a standard bullshit post here from Joe Biden. I don't know what else we could possibly expect, especially from the guy who, uh, you know, apparently is angry once again behind the scenes. He's always so mad at Benjamin Netanyahu, right? And somehow not changing his Israel policy after the deadly strike on aid workers. Biden was privately enraged. <laughs> privately. You can't even be publicly enraged. Just privately enraged. And in a public statement, he abraded Israel for it. I wouldn't even say that. But two senior officials said that it is as far as he will go for now. So even this, I mean, even when they kill an American, an American aid worker in what is obviously a deliberate war crime, even then, Joe Biden can't even show public anger, private anger behind the scenes. He's, he's crying in his bedroom at night. He's, all, he's so heartbroken about it that he's going to, you know, send Israel another $5 billion in fighter jets or whatever the fuck. I mean, Jesus Christ, man. Meanwhile, we have some new polling. This one was incredibly interesting. Hear from Prem Thacker as well. I mean, I've, I've been using his reporting clearly a lot recently, but uh, he's doing a good job. This was one poll that was done in Wisconsin. 100%, let me say that again, 100% of voters be below the age of 29 said they strongly or somewhat approve of an immediate and permanent ceasefire. 93.5% saying they strongly do. I mean, it, there's never been a poll with 100% on basically anything. You could you could poll the American people like, do you support, you know, killing puppies or something? And you wouldn't even get a 0% on that, right? You could, you could poll the American people, do you want free ice cream for the rest of your life? You wouldn't get 100%. Somehow, 100% under the age of 29, a core constituency for Joe Biden's re-election campaign, by the way, 100% support an immediate and permanent ceasefire. And I'll just leave you guys off with this. Biden administration presses Congress on $18 billion sale of F-15 fighter jets to Israel. And here's an old Joe Biden tweet straight out of his own mouth. My father had an expression, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. This is what Joe Biden values, guys. Continuing to send weapons to a country that is in the midst of committing a genocide.